Uh, okay, so uh, next up we have Gabriel Bassett and Anastasia Atanasov uh, from Verizon. They're on the DBIR team, so put your hands together. Okay, so we're not going to be talking about the DBIR report. In fact, we're not even going to be talking about the data in the DBIR report. This is all going to be about the process that goes in to the data. So the, the data janitor work, right? It's like 80% of the data scientist's work is you know, cleaning and preparing the data, and the other 20% is complaining about how the data isn't clean enough. And so, by the way, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. This is a really high uh, content per minute talk. It's very dense. And frankly, the slides are not that good. They're kind of boring. There's just a lot of words. Don't look at them. Um, we're, we're much better to look at. Like, we're not hard on the eyes. So look at us, listen to us. It's a lot better. And so the reason we wanted to do this talk was kind of threefold. Um, first, uh, this is not something that people normally talk about. Like, we talk about the models we create and the cool things and how well they did. We don't talk about all the process we did to get the data where it needs to be. Um, second, we wanted to help have people understand how we got to the number so that when you read the DBIR or whatever report, you can look at that number and understand the process that went into getting to that number. And finally, for those people who you know, are new to data science, we wanted to kind of give them an, an idea of here's what happens um, in reality with data scientists. Here's what they spend all their time on data-wise you know, and how they clean in the entire process behind it. And so this is, this is really, it's the agenda, but it's also the data flow. It's what the, pro the process our data goes through. And we're not going to really talk about how we store the data. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not going to talk about how we store the data, but we are, we, we store it in a Git repo and it just kind of lives there. And so unless we mention otherwise, that's where all the stuff is happening. And so, like, I'll just skip the, uh, the formal stuff. I'm the mad scientist on the team. I'm Anastasia Tanisoff. I'm a data scientist. I have a background in security and pure and applied mathematics. I'm one of the co-authors of the report, and then I do exploratory and statistical analysis on the data. And, yeah, I guess I should point out I am not Anastasia. I'm Gabriel, in case there was any confusion between the two of us. And so, talking about the report, um, if you aren't familiar with it, it's a report on like 100,000 incidents that happen each year. And, you know, the goal is for it to be data driven. We want it to be uh, done to academic rigor, but we give it a really cheeky voice so that it's actually fun to read because it's a report and reports aren't fun to read. You're going to try again. I'm sorry, that's not on. <laughs> that's why. Okay. You know, you told me before it was on, and so, well, I guess I, wa I wasn't on, live earlier. On, but the earlier. off switches, you know. <laughs> okay. Should I go back? No, I'm not going to go back. I'm not doing it. So, okay. So, you know, the first thing we need to kind of think about is what's data, right? And the clear way to answer that is to Google it. Um, and so I think this is kind of what we know data to be. It's, it's something that's solid. It's unchanging. It looks the same from every single angle. By the way, do you know you can buy a ball of Onyx on uh, eBay for five bucks and get it delivered from China in like three days? Like, that's impressive. I thought it was, I was like looking for a ball and I thought I was gonna get like some concrete thing. And like, I got this ball of Onyx. I feel like I probably stole it from some ancient, uh, you know, museum or something. And so, you know, that's kind of what we, we know. Like, that's the definition that we know. But reality is, we, we, this is what we feel data is like is it's a puzzle piece. And when we look at it, we don't really know where it fits or you know, what it means, but, but we're confident that if we analyze it and figure out its place in the puzzle, um, we can put this together and come up with a picture that really conveys some knowledge. Now, unfortunately, this is what data looks like. This is, this is the floor of my rec room. I mean, not my rec room, it's my kids. Well. No, it's actually both. We share the rec room. Some of these are my toys. Um, and so when we analyze data, it's re the reality is there's a bunch of pieces that don't actually fit together. Like they're not designed to easily connect. And so part of our job is to make the pieces fit together. Um, also, uh, they can fit together in many ways, right? With a puzzle, it only fits together one way. You only get one picture out of it. You know, if you're playing with Duplos, you can build anything you want. You can build a car or a boat or a car boat. Um, you can come up with whatever picture you want. And so 
the reason we need to talk about our methodology, talk about our process, is so that when we put the pieces together into a picture, we do it in a repeatable, verifiable, maintainable manner, and preferably move from a manual process where we can introduce errors to an automated process. And so the first step is getting in, preparing the data. I'm going to hand it over to Anna to do that section. All right, so when we get the data, we always look for a very robust and diverse data set. So we make continuous effort to recruit partners from all over the world with various focuses. And we also want to maintain a good working relationship with current partners from year to year. So um, these different focuses, of course, introduce some sort of bias, as bias is inherent in any kind of research. Um, it's not dichotomous, so it could occur in any phase of research, whether it be planning, data collection, analysis, or reporting. Because it's independent of sample size and variance, you do have to care about random error as well. So it's always a good idea to identify the different types of bias that you may encounter during your research, such as selection bias, detection, uh, exclusion bias, or even observer bias. So um, we consider the bias variance trade-off, and then with random error, that's when it's a good idea to start looking into hypothesis testing, and we look into our confidence intervals. So some potential partners may not meet our data standards, so this is where we will review and assist in their data collection methods if need be. Also, every partner stores their data in their own way. So what we do is we provide them with a standard Excel file for them to use, or we give them a web form for them to enter their data into. And then we take the various, you know, XLS, CSV, text file, or whatever, and we hand convert it into standard Excel in order to maintain consistency. So for those cases when we receive non-standard source data, what we do is we build mappings per partner. So we take their enumerations and we map them to ours, and we reuse these mappings each year. And then also to complete some of those mappings, we actually have to hand code various features, such as adding in NAICS codes for industries, and do any kind of necessary conversion, such as timestamps, in order to maintain that consistency. So many times data is missing complementary encodings, so we either manually edit or we use heuristic rules using a script. For example, if you have an incident or record that has malware.vector.webapp in the record, the rules will also add in asset.assets.webapp into that record in order to help complete the data. If there is missing data, we contact the partner, see if they can provide it. If not, we automatically add in the required field as uh, we put unknown in that required field. Also, because data is anonymized, we do add data to uh, account for traceability. So for example, there are fields that the partner does not provide, but we add in, such as DBIR year, um, source, or master ID in order to help with that traceability. Sometimes we have to remove things from raw data. Um, for example, we look at the source data, and we have to uh, ensure that it's actually deemed an incident. How we define an incident is that it is a security event that compromises the confidentiality, integrity, and avail availability of an asset. So we don't include things that are not compromised, there's no impact, or if it's just informational. We also remove unintended duplication for those cases where, a, where an incident can be represented multiple times in the raw data. And we also remove already aggregated data. Uh, for example, if we get a text file and it just has counts by industry or accounts by attack type or accounts by data type, it's very difficult to make individual correlations with the aggregated data because we don't have access to the individual incidents. So we make it a habit of reaching out to our partners and requesting that they don't provide aggregated data and the actual individual records. So for storing data, we have three main directories where we have our source data, first pass data, and review data. For our source data, this is our original unchanged raw data. We never delete it, and we always uh, keep copies for each iteration. We have our first pass data, which is where we just put the data into the DBIR format. So our collection, well, I'll get into that later. Um, so the data is examined and then it's prepared for import. And then for review data, we just take that first pass data, we review it for completeness, and then it's ready for import. So typically we have a couple uh, members of the team that look at the review data to make sure that it's consistent from this year compared to previous years and that we're actually working off the same data set. Next we convert the data into JSON, which is what our schema is built upon. So we use CSVs. We don't have to play around with worksheets. We don't have to play around with programming language parsers or anything like that. 
We use import scripts to convert input CSV to JSON. So each CSV is unique and it requires its own import script. Overall, we have three different Python conversion scripts to import those formats. The problem with these scripts is that they've been written by multiple authors in the past. So we have run into consistency challenges where it's sometimes hard to maintain. So one solution that we implemented was that we actually modularized those import scripts. We remove common portions to separate modules using heuristic rules. And then we have a single control script that we, where we import all the modules and then run the actual conversion process. Okay, okay I get the picture. And do you like the animation? It took me a long time to do that. I think it's very good. It's the only one in the chart. Like, I promise I didn't like animate. From here on out, it's all animations. So no. Um, we don't need to talk a whole lot about the schema, right? Because we're not going to be talking about the data. But what we do need to understand about the schema is what it means for the structure of the data. And so we need a schema that could bring in both structured and unstructured data, right? Because we have data out of SIMS that is very structured tabular data. But we also have case reports that have to be coded up. And so our, our um, schema is a JSON schema, which is actually like a literal thing. You know, it's, there's a standard for JSON schemas. And what it allows us to do is get a hierarchical structure for our data. Um, and the problem is this introduces a couple things that later on we're going to have to account for. Um, the first is the hierarchical nature. So if in normal, we have like an action, right? And the action could be hacking. But we have varieties of hacking. So action hacking variety SQL injection. Action hacking variety uh, cross-site scripting. Action hacking variety use of stolen credentials. And so we need to be able to capture, we're capturing at multiple levels of the hierarchy. And that's going to cause us parsing problems later on that we know how to solve because I wouldn't tell you about them if I couldn't solve them. Not kidding. Um, the other problem we have is that it creates multinomial data, non-exclusive multinomial data, in fact. So that normally what you'd have is you'd have a feature. And that feature would have a set of values it could take on. Well, our features can be multiple values at the same time. Action hacking variety can be cross-site scripting at the same time as its um, SQL injection, at the same time its use of stolen credentials. And the hierarchy, the JSON scheme is fine. It knows how to handle that. But again, as we get into parsing, we'll see how we have to um, accommodate that, those challenges. And so a, a word about kind of the, the schema, the technical realities of it. So, the scheme itself, it, we, it was good, but we realized that there were some fields we wanted for uh, DBIR. And then there were other fields that we wanted for our open data set VCDB. And then there were some fields that really you know, were just exclusive to those two things. So the community uh, schema didn't have that. So now we're up to three schemas. Um, and by the way, each schema isn't really represented by a single file. It takes multiple files to represent it because the parsing scripts use different um, uh, different pieces of the schema. And so now we've got five files per three uh, types. And of course, you know, it's not a static thing. We change it over time. So now there's iterations of it. So now we have five files by three schemas by multiple iterations. And, you know, it turns out that if you take that and you store it in a single repository under the same name and just hope that people understand which directories are which, um, you, you don't know what the hell is what. And so instead, we said, let's go find a better way to do that. And so we've broken it out by the, um, the repositories that the schemas live in. So our DBIR version of the schema lives in our DBIR repository. Veris community, the C, lives in the Veris repository. And now we have a very clearly defined set of files and what they do and what they're used for. And that's defined in the repository with them. And instead of adding directories within the repository for the different iterations, we just uh, iterate the entire repository. So we have good traceability. And these are things that are obvious. They're clear. No one would ever make these mistakes, right? Except us, you know, last year. Um, now, the next fun thing about this is the reality is there's, there's the schema. And then there's like the conversion script, and then there's the input file. And the theory is that the input file will be perfectly parsed by the um, conversion script, which will perfectly generate the schema. The reality is that 
physics does not require the same fields be in each one of those, right? It's not like magically because you said it was that way, that's what happens. What happens is that you have this, and it all agrees the first time someone writes it, but then someone over here on the input file decides that they want you know, a couple more enumerations. And so they put them in there, but they don't tell the guy who wrote the uh, import script. And so now it's here, and maybe they even put it in the schema. So the schema had something, but no one actually bothered to come back and tell the guys that wrote these two things to put it in there. Or they thought they were parsing it here, but someone commented that line of code out because it was really weird and they didn't understand it. And all of a sudden, over a couple of years, these things become inconsistent. And so we spent a lot of time this summer going back and making them consistent. And the reality was the, the, the issues are not in any of the major, or were not in any of the major places. They were minor things that really had low coverage um, enumeration wise, but this is one of those challenges we run into, is you have to have a plan for how you're going to keep all of those consistent. And so the next step, once you've gone through that, you've you know, parsed the data in the scheme, and now, now you want to validate, right? Because you, don't, you want to trust, but you want to verify. And we get uh, different th anomalies. We get kind of missing values or typos are the most common. Sometimes there's always one file that just you look at it and you're like, how could any of our tools have outputted that raw data? Like that is not physically possible. So you end up like spending hours going and fixing that one up. And like uh, Anna said, we have heuristic rules that we're applying. Um, we want to double check those heuristic rules. And so the validation script checks the heuristics. It also checks the business logic. We use Nix codes for industries. We want to check that even though that's a six digit or a five digit number, it's one of the valid codes because not all numbers are uh, valid. And so the, the validation script does that. And this is another pl place where we ran into an interesting technical challenge because it turns out validating you know, 100,000 records isn't always fast. And our Python script ran really, really slow at it. And so we're like, you know what? We can do this. We'll, we'll turn it into Node.js and we'll validate it in Node.js. And that works. It was fast, but added a huge amount of technical overhead because it added an entirely new tool chain to our process. And when you add that, one, it makes scripting a lot worse because now you're calling Node.js from Python. Um, and on top of that, you tell your team members, hey, you know, do you want to install Node.js? And they go, no. You know? And so they're like, you run it. And so now you're the only person who gets to run it. Um, we fixed that. We went back and looked at the Python code and figured out now the Python is actually faster than Node.js was, but better, we convinced, com, condensed it down to a more maintainable product. And in fact, because it's all Python, we can import the validation script and we can run that along with the import script so it's a single step process. And so, of course, if we're validating, that kind of implies that if we find anything, we have to revalidate or re-import. In fact, um, we also get a lot of new data. You know, our partners give us data over time. You know, they give us this set and they go, well, we've got some more and they keep adding. And it turns out that if you have 40 partners providing incident data, we had 70 partners, 40 or so of them provide incident data. And you have to do these iterations multiple times. It's a really great opportunity to um, uh, look for speed because I'm the one that has to do this. And, you know, it turns out, um, we had it down to four steps last year. And, but every hour I had to come back to my computer, type in some line of code, hit the button, and leave for an hour. And it turns out when you do that four times at an hour each step, it takes four hours to go through each freaking iteration. It's my time, you know? And you can't like have a beer while you're doing that. And so the team like finishes up the coding at like five o'clock. They're like, great, Gabe, we're ready for you to start importing it. And like nine o'clock, I can finally have my freaking beer. And I, don't, I wanna have my beer earlier than that. And so this year we're bringing it into a more um, push button style. We're keeping state in the system so that we can just hit a button. It will realize, okay, these are the files that changed. Those are the ones that need to be re-imported, revalidated. It will rerun that. Assuming it gets no validation errors, it will tell us if it gets them, it will let us know. And that way we've done it. And it, it gets us speed. It gets us consistency. It gets us repeatability. In fact, it lets us, we, we parallelize this. Blah parallelize us now so that each individual partner coming in gets its own process and we're running five or ten processes at the same time which makes this so much faster and so now we've got a hundred thousand JSON records right and the way we analyze these is we print everyone out and then we put them in front of a, a camera and then we just flip them really quick and we look for what we do is we put them in R the, the whole picture thing isn't happening. Um, so who here has used R? Yeah, a couple of Okay, so R likes tables, right? It likes tabular data. Does R like JSON? 
No, R doesn't like JSON. Um, it will work with it, but it's not what it's designed for. And so now we need to cram a tree, a hierarchical structure, into a data frame. And this is where we start to run into those problems with the hierarchical nature and the multinomial, uh, uh, the non-exclusive multinomial uh, structure of the data. And so the way we handle this is we make every leaf in the JSON schema its own column. So there is a column for action, hacking, variety, cross-site scripting. And it's a Boolean column. It's true or false. And so every record that has it is true, not is false. And we have another column for action, hacking, variety, SQL injection. Another one for lost and stolen assets. And so now we've solved our, um, the problem of storing our non-exclusive multinomial data. But that doesn't solve the hierarchical problem. And so we're going to have to add in some surrogate columns to deal with that. So we're going to have to add in a column for action.hacking. And the way we're going to fill that in is anything that has a variety of action hacking is going to have action hacking is true as well. And so now we've accounted for our hierarchical data. But again, and that one now is pretty easy to parse. It doesn't have the parsing problems that the, um, the non-exclusive data has. Um, let's see. Now, a final thing is like this is all your current data set. You like you you did all this process. You know you brought in your hundred thousand records, but we don't want to just know about what happened today. We want to know about what happened last year and what happened the year before. And so it's important to keep your data in the same format from prior years and keep it someplace accessible, so that when you import, you're not just importing your current data set. You're also importing those historic ones, and you need to be able to Im to upgrade them. So if I use schema version two today. And last year, I used schema version one. I need some way to take those other you know, 200,000 records and bring them up to date. You know, and this is all straightforward stuff. It's all easy, but it's all things to think about. And if you don't think about them, you run into them when you try to do the process. And so once we've got it all into the data frame and nice into a place to analyze it, it's time to start exploring it. And I'll hand it over to Anna to do that. <laughs> so we've made the exploration <laughs> process more um, I was playing with the audio. I think I'm louder than you are, possibly. Oh. Hello yeah. out there. OK. Uh, so we made the exploration process more efficient by actually pre-generating a lot of the more common exploratory analysis. Um, we auto-generate three reports where we slice and dice the data in different ways. By the way, we use Knitter, which is an R markdown language for reporting. Um, so what, how we slice and dice the data is that we look at the overall summary. We look at trends over time, and then also any significant changes since the previous year. The reason why we look at the very it, look at it from different perspectives is that we don't always know if the features value or its trend over time is actually going to be more interesting. And then also with these reports, we actually run them twice, so we run it for incidents and then breaches as well. We also run these reports for the overall data set and then also subsets. So this includes patterns. Um, uh, industries or partners. So overall, we are working around, there's a, probably a total around 8,500 figures generated in total. And this is another place, by the way, where we parallelize. So these reports take a long time to run because there's so much data in them. And so we end up running, you know, five or 10 reports at the same time as well in our workflow. For exploring the data, we also don't wait until the data is complete to start doing the actual exploratory analysis. Um, we can already gain insight before the data is complete. And then um, we also start the exploratory analysis early because it helps us to find any kind of anomalies that we may need to go back to the raw data or the source. So we run these reports early and we run them often. Also, as a note, it's an easy mistake to uh, only look at your current version of of your data. Uh, Gabe and I make it a habit to actually explore the data frame manually because sometimes we may be able to gain insight that the pre-generated pre reports don't capture. And the key thing is to always go back to your raw data. So our main objective is to make novel findings, to start developing our hypotheses. These hypotheses help us to decide, all right, what do we actually need to talk about in the report? We look for things that are big, that have changed significantly between years, things that are commonly seen together, and things that we would, you know, we've seen patterns, and we're, they're almost predictable. But we also want to take care to um, see what's unexpected and what may cause that. So it's also not enough to actually find something that's novel. We have to answer the question, okay, why? Why is it relevant? 
So this is where we put the finding into some sort of context. So first we have to see, is the finding actually true? Or do we need to fix something in the source data or the import process? We use tools such as association rules to help to answer the question of why a finding is relevant. Um, so these association rules show us how enumerations relate to other features and what had occurred most pertaining to the novel finding. So uh, we use some key attributes for association rules such as support, confidence, and lift. And then we also look at the distribution of a feature with and without an enumeration. For example, if we want to look at action, we will look at the distribution with actor.internal excluded as well as not actor.internal. So we, not, we end up looking at the entire distribution and seeing how it shifts. And we don't look at just one enumeration, but actually a set. We, not only do we look at incident data, we also look at non-incident data. It helps to answer the question of why a key finding is relevant. Uh, and it also helps to put our incident and breach data into some sort of context. So non-incident data is not as refined as incident data. We may not necessarily you know, get what we need or want from the partner. There's no standard schema. It takes uh, a lot of time to do exploratory analysis because that's all manual for non-incident data. And then we make sure to communicate with the partner to make any kind of clarifications, or maybe they'll be able to provide some additional data to us. The, all, the other nice thing about non-incident data is that we can correlate findings across multiple data sets. So say a partner sends us malware data, where he, and we maybe find something that's interesting or a key finding. Well, what we actually do is we collect multiple data sets and then we're able to actually increase our sample size, which decreases our random error. And we're able to verify those key findings. And then non-incident data grows quickly, and um, it's quite big. So what we use is 32 or 64 gigs of RAM and an SSD, which is very sufficient. So we didn't spin up any Spark cluster or anything. Um, and we also spun up a NAS to share our data files. This really helps to ensure consistency. So if Gabe generates a stat and I validate it, um, we're actually working off the recleaned version, which saves a lot of time. So then from exploring, we actually have to start thinking, you know, go moving into the writing phase. So first, we have to decide what actually constitutes the data set. Not all records are made the same. Some records have a lot of unknowns in the required fields. So what we do is we score all the records for complexity, and then we discard all those records uh, that are below a certain threshold. So to date, we, we ha our threshold is set to seven enumerations. And this helps us to answer, OK, what actually encompasses the data set? Uh, because the goal is that we want to represent all legitimate data. The data set will end up being a combination of, sub of subsets of the full data corpus. So for example, in 2016, uh, we had over 300,000 records, but the data set actually ended up being a little over 230,000 records. So after removing those low complexity records, um, the next thing is to identify and review all the major subsets of the data. So this is normally in the several hundred breaches to several thousand incidents. For example, in 2016, our major subsets of the data was dry decks and web app attacks. So we have to understand what causes those major subsets in the data, and we need to consider several, several things. So first, does the limited number of sources report a lot of common low fidelity incidents, which was reflected in web app attacks? Did a limited number of sources have a unique view that added a lot of high quality incidents, and this was reflected in Drydex? And then finally, did something unique happen this year that made something stand out across sources? And this is where we actually started getting into our, into our patterns, where we see the same types of attacks happening over and over. So then we have to answer the question, OK, how do, you, how do these major subsets affect the overall data set? Do, does it look like they don't affect it at all? Do they skew it in a way? Um, or do they eclipse it entirely? So we have to decide on how to handle these. First, we analyze the subset as part of the overall data set, and then we just caveat the SKU, which is what we did with Drydex in our report. We could also analyze the data set separately, which is what we did for web app attacks. And then we could also do both, which is where we start getting into our patterns. So overall, before writing, we need to work off a single subset of the data. This is our subset in Varus, and by at this point, we've decided what to include and exclude from the data set. 
We're also looking at approaches of accommodating for skewness. Uh, specifically, you can reduce skewness by applying transformation. So you replace a variable with a function of that variable. So if you want to reduce right or positive skewness, uh, where extreme data results are larger, you'll have frequent small losses and few extreme gains, and that's where you want to start taking your roots, logs, and reciprocals. If you want to reduce left or negative skewness, where extreme data results are um, smaller, frequent small gains and few extreme losses, that's where you want to start taking your squares, cubes, and higher powers. So then the fun begins when we start actually generating our stats and developing our hypotheses. First, we differentiate between an incident and a breach in our analysis, and then um, when we report the stats in the yeah, when we report on the stats in the report. So I had defined how we define an incident, and we define a breach as a security incident that has confirmed data disclosure of an asset to an unauthorized party. We also need to be aware of what constitutes a filter. For example, if you take the field year, it can be interpreted three different ways. First, incident year. That's the year that the incident occurred. Second, we have DBIR year. This is a DBIR year the data was assigned to. So our collection period is from November to November. And then finally, we can look at it as data set year, and this is the year that the data was actually imported. So for coding up incidents in VCDB, say we code up we code up in 2016, the actual incidents occurred several years ago. It would be inappropriate to include them into this year as current incidents in the report because they had occurred pri in prior years. So the key here is that those said incidents are assigned to the DBIR year associated to the actual incident year. We also have to be careful when people request for stats regarding year. So if they ask for a stat across multiple years, we usually assume calendar year. If they ask for this year, we usually assume data since last report. Again, we always communicate and clarify that we're talking about the same thing. And also, again, we exclude those old incidents that we just happened to code up this year, but that actually had occurred in previous years. Then we also have to be careful of catch-alls. For example, unknown other NNA. What's measured, what's not measured, do we count it or do we not? For unknown, we consider it as not measured. It doesn't add any additional knowledge when we encode the unknowns. Because it adds no data, we typically exclude it. For others, we consider it measured, but it's just not covered in our schema. So it does add data, so we do include it. Finally, with NAs, it actually depends on the question. So if we're asking what percent of breaches involved a financial motive, we would typically include this, because some breaches just have no motive. But if we're asking what percent of motives are financial, we exclude it because NA is not a motive. So those questions sound like they're asking similar things, but they're actually quite different. Then comes counting N. How do we count N? The normal way to calculate it is that we count how many of each enumeration, we sum up the counts, and we get our N. This doesn't work for those records and incidents that have multiple enumerations. So for example, if you have one incident that is both social and malware, it will be counted more than once. So instead what we do is that we subset the records that we care about or that we want to analyze. We exclude our unknowns and any potentially NAs. And then, um, you know, then we sum up, the, we n count the number of records, i.e. the number of rows, before summing up those features. Next, we look at confidence. This is very important when we're subsetting data because our sample sizes decrease quite quickly. This is where you want to start looking into your random error. Um, we look at confidence intervals. We want to see if they overlap. For example, if we're, we're, you know, we're working with statements like hacking was greater than malware this year or hacking increased from last year. So just to recall, if there's no overlap, in the confidence intervals, this implies that the difference is statistically significant. If there is overlap, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, that the difference is not statistically significant. So depending on who you talk to, people define confidence intervals slightly differently. Um, it is correct to say that there is a 95% chance that the confidence interval you calculated includes a true population mean. Some other people define it as there's a 95% percent chance that the population mean lies within the interval, which is not quite correct. Also, if you want to uh, be more confident that an interval contains a true parameter, 
Um, so for instance, we instead of 95%, we want to look at 99%. The interval will become wider. Um, if there's more variance in our data, it also creates wider intervals, and as well as um, smaller sam sample sizes, that creates wider intervals. And um, we know that there's an inverse square root relationship between confidence intervals and sample sizes, so if you want to decrease your margin of error by half, you'll technically have to quadruple your sample size. So overall, we calculate these confidence intervals. We don't include them in the report because a majority of our readership could care less about the actual upper and lower <laughs> limits. Um, we can treat our data in two main ways. So we can we look at it from the binomial perspective, which is w what we have done in previous years and to date. It depends on what question you're asking for binomial versus multinomial. For binomial, we work with primarily Boolean columns. So you know, was it for an incident? Was it you know social a social incident? True or false? Malware? True or false? Was their data disclosure true or false? Um, so again, this was our primary one, but the problem here is that it doesn't model interdependencies between features. So that's where it's nice to start looking at it from a multinomial perspective, especially for those records that have more than one enumeration, because you're not only looking at a singular enumeration, you're actually looking at a set. We have a crop ton of stats in the DBIR, lots of percents. Uh, we can't ever say that there was X number of breaches in, you know, in the past year. We never know the population size. We always work with sample sizes. So our per, for our percentages, we break it down by action or by pattern or whatever it may be. The problem is that when, it, when one enumeration increases, it may look like another enumeration is decreasing. For example, if you have 100 hacking breaches in 2015 and in 2016, then you look at malware. You have 10 in 2015 and you have 1,000 in 2016. Malware is going to look like it's increasing but it's going to make hacking look like it's decreasing when in fact it was actually consistent per year. So with things like that, when we generate figures and it looks a little bit misleading, um, we are very careful to annotate that for our readership to avoid any kind of confusion. So then after we generate all these stats, then we have to actually validate those hypotheses which Gabe will get into. So I got to talk about validating the data. Now I get to talk about validating those hypotheses, right? Um, well, we'll start with the figures. So this is one of the things that, in reality, when people say they read the DBR, what they really said was, I, I looked at the figures. Because, you know, that's like, that's the standard way. In fact, it's cool if, like, when we're briefing the DBR way, I cast that question, and you're like, who read the DBR? And there's, like, a few people. It's like, if you ask who read it first, like, a bunch of people raise their hand. If you ask who looked at the figures first, you get a lot of hands there, and then no one raises their hand for the reading question, because they weren't really sure where you were going with, like, when you asked reading first, and they're like, I, I don't want to, like, not raise my hand here and make it sound like I didn't even look at it. But people look at the figures, right? That's, that's how we communicate. And so we want the figures to communicate our points clearly, right? And so we, we use the common ones. We use bar graphs, and we use line charts. You know, very... Um, standard ways to go, but you can communicate clearly um, without necessarily being simple. You can have complex figures that communicate clearly, and we try to put a little bit of variety in. We had a parallel coordinates chart. We actually had an arc plot in there uh, for everyone that read like into the appendix. Um, but the important thing is how you track these figures for validation. So we talked about we run the exploratory reports, right? Um, every one of those exploratory reports with every one of those figures has a unique ID on it. And when they, someone from our team goes, okay, we're going to put this figure into the report or into the section I'm writing, we capture that unique ID and all the code associated with that figure, and it goes into a validation, a figure report for us. And that figure report has the unique ID, it has the title, which is effectively the hypothesis for that figure, and then it has the entire code to generate it. Um, that way we can track it, and we can track it as things change. And if someone comes and requests one of us to do a figure for them, we give them the unique ID. That way, as the report is being um, written and put together, we have the idea of the figures that are in it, and we have a report that can generate them all. And that way we have confidence that we can repeat those figures and can do them consistently. Um, and we do this all with Knitter. Um, the same thing we do the exploratory reports with. And we do it with ggplot. Has anyone here used ggplot? Has anyone written like a ggplot figure that was really nice in like under 10 lines? It's big, but you get really nice um, layout quality figures from it. It's the way to go. And by the way, so 
we wrote the report and then um, and they did this last year. We went on a podcast with a, a professor who specializes in data figures and had him critique it because we want to continuously get better. And you know what he, he didn't say a whole lot, but you know what he said? And it doesn't count if you actually listen to the podcast. He, so do, do you remember like the flow graphs? They were really bright and they had lines and stuff in them. Um, he's like, yeah, you can't use those ever again. People can't read those. And we really, we kind of knew it, but we included them for consistency. But next year, we're probably going to replace them with uh, small multiples charts. Also, a great idea is he took the figures and he said, look, you've got this figure that's got this one really big bar and these little bars. Why don't you put like a big, big red letter A on that bar? And then in your, in your text, you can put that same big uh, red letter A. That way, people that want to know what that bar is or why it's big can find the spot easily in your text. It's a great recommendation. And it's one we'll hopefully see in the DBR next year. And what we do for figures, we want to do for our, all of our hypotheses, right? So you see statements like hacking was greater than malware, or uh, malware increased since last year, or you know, phishing was 40% of breaches. Every single one of those statements in the report this year was in a va uh, validation report. And we probably made a mistake in that this year, last year we waited till the report was written and we wrote those. Next year, every single time we give out a stat, we're gonna give out a unique ID with it. And we're in our validation report, we're gonna put that unique ID, we're gonna put the hypothesis, and we've got this report for this year's. Um, put the hypothesis, we're gonna put the code to generate it, and we're gonna put the outcome. That way, every single number, every single statement in there can be tracked back to the logic which arrived at. And it's, so it's very similar to the, um, the uh, figure report. And the important thing, or the reason that you need to do this is because anomalies creep in. But you know, there's something you can do about keeping those anomalies out. Um, the first is start from a single code base. Like it's, it's just bad juju if I'm like, I'm running one version of R and Anna's running another version because we may come up with the same numbers, we may not. It depends what's changed between the versions. Um, in fact, it's really bad if I like actually change what version of R I'm running during the process. So like we have a cutoff somewhere in like the fall where it's like we stop updating our statistical software until like after the last version, the last iteration of that DBR is published because we don't want to uh, break our workflow or change our workflow midstream. The next is you want a single data starting point. So like Anna said, we, we have a lot of records and we have to ultimately choose what are we going to analyze as the main set and what's going to be analyzed as um, unique subsets uh, separately. Because we want to represent all valid data, but we don't want our data to, one set of data to eclipse others. And so it's important to very clearly label what that starting point is. All of the ana analysts that work with the data know where to start with their data. We all start at the exact same point. And that helps us with repeatability. And additionally, we also have a common analysis process. We all use dplyr. Who uses dplyr for our people? Oh, come on. We have, that's, so wait, so we, we had a lot of people who used R, and very few hands went up for dplyr. Like if, there we go, at least one person, because if you're using R and not using dplyr, you are going to be amazed at how, like, actually logical R can be. You know, as opposed to, like, feeding stuff backwards in time, uh, you normally do it, you like actually get to feed things forward. And so we use this standard process for doing it. And because of that, it's very easy for us to all arrive at the same answer every time. And so on the other hand, there's places where we've tried to do things like the association rules. We talked about those. So with the association rules, um, we've had issues where like we generated stats and we generated interesting stuff in the association rules, but they're very hard to replicate. You have to start with the exact same data, um, the exact same columns. We can't run it on all of our columns, so we have to subset the same. And then it's like any machine learning algorithm, the arguments you give to it strongly affect what the actual outcome is. And so unless you got all that exactly the same as the first time you ran it, you're not going to get the same answer. So instead, you know, for something like association rules, we're going to go back and recreate those stats using our normal dplyr process. That way we have confidence in the repeatability of them. And so, and by the way, um, like we talked about in this track yesterday, uh, it doesn't matter what your stats are if there's not a so what to them. And so you're going to do all these great stats, you're going to do all this analysis, great confidence intervals, and when it comes time to write, tons of it's going to get cut out, just like line after line. Like, you would not believe how much, like it's our favorite, it's always the best analysis, mm -hmm. isn't it? Like the stuff out. that we love gets cut out. 
And so it's important to just be prepared for that. Because if there's no so what behind your data, it doesn't matter how good the stats were, the analysis was, it doesn't go in. And so looking forward, um, we're doing a lot of work. Uh, the first on Varus, um, we're currently iterating versions to increase the enumerations to get a more coverage on what people want. Um, we're also going to fix some consistency um, issues in the hierarchy on the next version. And then we're going to go to sequencing so that you can, in various, you can record this action happened, then this one, then this one. Or this action happened and it compromised this, which led to this. You know, which will let us capture some additional granularity as well as being able to represent things like pen tests. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on Veris R, which is the R package that parses Veris data. Um, we're doing some internal changes to uh, make it easier to work with it for those who have to deal with this kind of stuff. It currently uses data tables, which sound really great until they break everything you do like once a month. And so we're going to get back off those. It turned out it sounded good when we did it. Um, we're also putting in additional uh, helper code and functions and more um, analysis tools within it. It's stuff that currently resides in a separate repository, but we want to make sure it's available to everyone. And we're putting in more statistical tools and adding in things so that other people can run confidence intervals when they're working with R. Veris R is, by the way, all this stuff is open. You can download off GitHub. Um, we're also working on our workflow. And by the way, when we're updating this stuff, we're updating it in a consistent manner, especially like updating the Veris schema. You know, we have a huge chart for everything so that every single thing in the entire workflow gets updated at the same time and we don't have half the workflow on one thing and half on the other. And that's hard to do, but it's something you need to plan for if you're going to maintain um, a tool like this, a data tool. And so we're updating our workflow, uh, making it easier, more repeatable, faster, um, and generally trying to um, make the whole system easy to run, consistent, and repeatable. And before we get to the conclusion, there's one thing I want to talk about here. Um, we all generate data products. And, and we've come to terms with the data. But not everyone in the world, ha in fact, not everyone in information security has. Because you know, it's hard when your brain is telling you something. Like someone's telling you something with data, and your brain is telling you something different. right? And because you look at the data, and it feels a bit like magic. Right, that analysis process, even when the entire methodology is disclosed, it still feels a little like magic because your brain is saying, I don't know if I believe that data. Um, but there's a sign um, in uh, the UK, it's like uh, art on the side of a building, it says, uh, your mind is crazy and tells you lies. Right? And you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Because if you kind of contrast what happens with your brain, right? Your brain can organize all this. Like, it'd be great if you had a process, but you, like, you could put this all into a single picture. Um, but it takes a lot of skill and a lot of thought to turn that into something interesting, all those disparate parts. And that's what your brain has to do. And the downside is there's, there's no documentation of what your mind did, right? How those ideas were formed. There's, you don't know what data went into it. You know, maybe your mind excluded all the little cardboard bricks. Maybe it brought in a bunch of. Uh, Lincoln logs and added those because they were somewhere in your mind and so it decided to include them in your model. You know, you have no way of telling that. You have no way of questioning or validating the process that went into creating the picture. Uh, and you have no way of maintaining consistency. So like today I might look at this and know that looks like a flamingo. You know, and you know, a few months down the road I get the same problem with the same data and I'm like, great, that's a Tonka truck. You know, you have no way of maintaining consistency over time. Your mind is a black box. Um, Andy Ellis, the CISO at Akamai, I think is planning on giving a presentation on this called the Complexity Apocalypse. You know, and his base thing is that information security risks are now too complex for system one, for, for gut instinct analysis. And so it's important that us as you know, data-driven people you know, encourage people to build a mental model that satisfies all the facts, right? Those that come from their mind and those that come from the data. So in conclusion, you know, the data is not perfect. It never is, it never will be, but you're here to help it tell its story, but not torture it. Have a consistent process, you know, and if possible, automate for repeatability. More importantly, document everything you do. Put a unique ID on everything you generate. Question everything that, everything of interest, and communicate, because when you communicate, for the people that consume your report, it helps them understand the process that went into the numbers. And for, the pe for you, 
it helps you understand and learn from the people who are using your information. And so with that, um, I think I left, good for me, I left like five minutes for questions. So you mentioned the uh, fun stuff that doesn't make the report because it failed the so what <laughs> test. Yeah. Any favorites or <sighs> items? It was all the malware analysis. Yeah. Disappointed by? We, we pretty much, uh, we slice and dice specific uh, malware names and we wanted to see what families were very prominent. Um, and we did a, couple, it did a couple more stuff with malware, but it just didn't make it in. I don't yeah, know. there was a lot around like, so we talked about uh, the subsets of the data, right? And we talked about how non-incident data adds context. Well, part of the reason we put left the Drydex subset in the overall data set, um, and as opposed to analyzing it separately, was because when we looked at the malware data, you could see the impact of Drydex in it. Um, there was just a significant amount of, um, of botnet data. And what it really was, was it was executables coming by email or infected malware, uh, infected Word documents or Office documents coming by email. And so you could see how these bots were actually happening significantly. And it helped inform us on um, in how we handled the data. And we had some really pretty cool pictures. Like they were all done. We did them like up to the final quality and they just didn't make the final cut. But if you ever get a chance to like see either of our like actual DBR presentations, like it's, it's ours. We, they can't tell us not to use those figures. We got them. So like I got them all in my, my presentation. Yeah. Welcome. Two quick questions, uh, somewhat related. You mentioned um, three different schemas. Yeah. Uh, that's the first I've heard of multiple schemas when it comes to the analysis and uh, the storage of the data. Is this something new to this year's report or does No, this we only operate on a single one of those schemas. We always use the DBIR schema, but there's, there's some things, like if, if you look at the schema, you notice there's a plus section, and that plus section is marked to allow additional features in it. And the idea is that if you as an organization have things that are relevant to you but not to other people, you can put them in there. Like we, we used to deal with a lot of PCI data. And so we have you know, specific PCI uh, enumerations that really aren't part of the overall schema, but that we have. And then we use a DBIR. One, DBIR year is actually a plus thing. It's in the DBR schema, but it's not in the, the standard schema. And the reason is because most people don't care about what year the data was imported in the DBIR because they're not importing to the DBIR. And so it's just like little helper stuff like that that's specific to us. So we always use the um, DBIR schema, and the DBIR schema is 95% the community schema. That gets to my other questions. Um, have you published what the different schemas are and disclosed um, within the report? Because I don't recall reading this, um, the, those differences so that as um, other data scientists, other analysts are taking a look at the community schema, what's up on um, the community site. Um, they can reproduce your results using your methods. Well, which should be part they'll be of the able process. to reproduce. So th this gets back partially to the data. Um, because of the data sources, our agreements are that we are not allowed to share the data. Like if you create any analysis on VCDB and send it to us, we'll run it on our data set and give you back the analysis. But our agreements don't allow us to share the actual data. And so ultimately, there will never be kind of the perfect reproducibility. Um, but I've got no problem sharing the uh, additional um, features that are in the DBR stuff. We talk about them a lot. You're going to be sorely disappointed because there's nothing exciting in there. All the cool stuff happens in the community schema. Like, you know, because really what people care about, we call them the four A's, right? Action, in fact, it was in the schema thing, like the, on the circles. That's where 99% of our parsing comes from. And the stuff that gets in the plus section, in fact, unfortunately, it's a lot of stuff that they like kind of tried. They're like, let's try to see if this um, feature gets coded in or we can fill stuff into it. And it turns out, no, it didn't get used at all. And so you, even in the plus section for other than like the metadata ones like DBR year, it's just all columns and nodes. You don't, it, it's in the schema, but there's no actual data in it. But it, there's no problem to share it. You know, it doesn't really affect Has anything. Has it been shared? Um, I don't, so I'm trying to think what the best way to share it would be because I don't. On the Varus website? But that's, this is what I'm worried about, right? Because if I put that on the Varus website, now I've put two schemas, two different schemas side by side. And I don't want people looking at it and going, well, which one of these should I be using? 
you know, the, que the answer is you should be using the community schema because that one's designed to meet the needs of the community. And if you use the additional features, you know, potentially it would confuse you. And also we're not as good about keeping those additional ones as clean as we do the community ones. Like there's some, there's like some enumerations that I was cleaning it up this year. And I'm like, hey, why'd you guys, like, what is this field? Why is this in here? And they're like, oh yeah, we tried that out like three years ago and it didn't work and we never took it out of the, the, private, the private schema. And so I'd also be worried about confusing people. But, you know, it, I, I'd be happy to email you or, you know, and I, we've got a blog, but it turns out that getting stuff on the blog is a whole, um, a lot of work. And so there's got to be some way, maybe in the, so there's, there's a DBIR repo um, that we use to, that's got all the figures. And in fact, if you didn't know this, um, last year we posted all the figures there. This year we posted um, the figures plus the data behind the figures in an RDA file. And then next year, I'm going to try to see if I can post the validation uh, report in there. But I could probably dump it in there. Um, I'll need to be reminded. I forget things very quickly. Um, but if you email me at dbir at verizon.com, I'll make sure it happens. I'm just thinking this would go a long way introducing some of the criticism that the report has gotten over the years, especially this past year regarding vulnerability data. Well, but it or wouldn't. openness about the sausage. I think this presentation is great. Um, I, I think this should be shared more widely. Sure, if you think it would help, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, I, I think this would reduce a lot of criticism yeah. of Verizon's got to know these reports. Yep. We've got to get set up for the next Yeah, time. cool, thank you.